Hey there, this is Seth Schaefer from Team Just Cause Robotics. In today's video, we'll cover all of the changes and upgrades I've made to Division since it last competed in November 2020's Norwalk Havoc event. I've also created a playlist of all of my prior Division overview videos, and I'll link that in the description so I don't have to repeat myself too much here. Last time, I made an overview video just before Division competed at Norwalk, and I said several things in that video that I was confident in from testing, which turned out to be completely wrong in battle. I thought I could spin up without face planting due to the more rigid 3D printed forks, but in reality, they didn't help much at all and broke off immediately in multiple fights. I thought the weapon system would keep working reliably after surviving many hits because it managed to survive hitting my test box floor over and over and over, but in truth, the weapon motor managed to shake itself loose in every fight, removing the bot's ability to self-write. I also said my new jumper T8SG transmitter was a nice upgrade but then it bricked itself 5 minutes before a fight, forcing me to switch to my backup transmitter, which was meant for mini mulcher, and nearly requiring me to forfeit that fight. In general, although Division went 2-2, two and two, it was due to a lot of dumb luck and some helpful saves from Brett. Without the ability to reliably self-write, Division's just a stupid glass cannon. This time, I'm reporting to you AFTER Division has already competed in the February 6th Norwalk Havoc event in 2021. So rest assured, I'm not full of crap this time. Nearly all of my upgrades did exactly what they were meant to do, and Division's working so much better than it did in November. Due to a couple of unrelated dumb mistakes on my part, Division still only won two fights, but I'm infinitely more confident that it's at least capable of making deep competition runs in the future, and I'm not planning to make any major changes before the next tournament. In fact, I'm so confident in this version of the design, you can now buy the full CAD assembly from my web store to see exactly what went into this version of Division. Check the link in the description down below if you're interested, and while you're down there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. The goal of my laundry list of upgrades and changes this time around was to fix every weak link in the chain that led to issues in November. This included strengthening how the custom brushless gearbox is mounted to the frame, keeping rigid front forks attached to the robot, and most importantly, massively overhauling the weapon system. Last competition, I killed a weapon motor due to the bearing exploding from the forces it took from delivering hits to other robots weapon on weapon. The motor was experiencing massive shock loads from Division's own hits. In order to get adjustable belt tension, I had slaughtered the motor mounts on that version's uprights, but this proved to be a grave error as the motor could vibrate itself and the screws loose, and then the belt would lose all tension, resulting in minimal torque transfer and the inability to self-write. This time around, I switched to a considerably bigger and beefier weapon motor, with a 5mm shaft versus 4mm before, much much bigger and stronger bearings, and I designed and fabricated brand new weapon uprights, which not only position the motor in just the right spot for perfect belt tension every time, but there are no slots that could potentially cause issues. So even if the screws loosen a bit, belt tension should remain, unless they completely come out. However, even without slots, the shock from hits could vibrate those screws out, so, I also switched from using a pulley that was set screwed directly to the motor shaft to one using a special type of hub called a fairlock hub, which is a specialized clamping collar style hub, allowing you to tighten the clamping screw to achieve different levels of slip torque and basically acting like a slip clutch. This meant I could dial it in to provide enough torque to self-right and spin the weapon, but on huge impacts, the motor shaft could slip on the pulley, which massively reduces the instantaneous impact forces experienced by the motor. Even if the motor now comes to a stop in 20 thousandths of a second instead of 1 thousandth of a second, that still reduces the force experienced by the motor by 20 times, which makes it far less likely that it is going to shatter magnets or bearings. Now the other major benefit to this motor, besides having a larger shaft, is that it can provide a lot more torque than the one I'd been using before. Previously, I was running a 3000 kV motor, which means that for every volt of electricity I provide, it spins 3000 RPM and I was running it on 3S, which is about 12 volts. Currently, I've upped my 3S battery to a 4S battery, and I'm running with this much larger but lower KV motor, which is rated for 1850 KV. So it spins 1850 revolutions per minute per volt, and I'm running it at around 16 volts. So it actually ends up spinning a couple thousand RPM less than it used to, but with the benefit of having lots more torque. Despite also running a slightly different pulley ratio of 3 to 1 instead of 3.3 to 1, 
This weapon motor can still supply almost double the torque that the previous motor could, so it should be much easier for Division to self-right using this motor than it did with the last one. It also shouldn't be stressing the speed controllers or the battery as much, as I have it set so that the current limit on the speed controller is only 40 amps, even though this motor could in theory draw peaks of over 60 amps. So this way, when previously my weapon motor was drawing over 75 amps for a fraction of a second at a time to self-write, I can now happily self-write with just a 40 amp current limit and a 100% ramp up power limit and the weapon will spin up just as fast as before because of all the extra torque this motor has. It also handles reversing on the fly a lot better than the previous motor. Speaking of spinny things, I found myself using the S-shaped weapon blade I designed a lot in the last competition, but it doesn't have the bite benefit of my asymmetric weapon, so I designed a brand new weapon I call the Cutter Blade. This badass blade has an aggressive sharp edge, designed to bite and tear into the multitude of soft plastic and aluminum armored robots but it's made of the same AR-500 armor steel that shooting targets are made from, just like my other weapons, so it won't mind delivering hits to other steel weapons either. The major benefit of this tip shape is that the tooth recedes away from the outermost diameter right after it passes by, so if I'm fighting a horizontal spinner, I'll be able to hit them with the tip of the tooth, but if the point misses them, it'll most likely not get a sideways hit from their weapon. The asymmetric single tooth shape has the same benefits as Uppercut's weapon was described to on BattleBots. By engaging only once per revolution, I can move that much closer to the opponent to deliver a more solid hit and cut that much deeper with every shot. If this weapon isn't slicing through soft armor, it should be able to dig into harder armor and launch the opponent into the air with ease. The last two things to discuss are the gearbox mounting and forks. I'll be brief. The gearbox used M3 nuts and slots and M3 screws to mount in the previous version, only because that was a holdover from the brushed drive system I'd used last year. In order to improve the mounting, I decided that I would need to use three screws instead of two, and I moved to using plastite screws that could thread directly into the 3D printed plastic rather than using nuts that had to be slotted in. This meant that I had to mill a new hole in each of my titanium side armor plates, as well as widening the existing two holes that I was using before. So I 3D printed a PLA jig that I could use to mount the titanium piece inside of it and clamp it in the milling vise on the Tormox CNC machine at my local makerspace. Then I programmed it to mill out those holes using an 8th inch carbide end mill that's much harder than titanium, and it went through all of them in pretty quick succession. I then took all of my titanium forks that I also had laser cut and I got them countersunk with a carbide countersink that I got off Amazon for $30, which took quite a while since I had to countersink 22 of them, each of which had three holes. After all of that, I also had to belt sand the edges to bevel them a little bit and to dull the point so that it wouldn't get stuck underneath a wall of the arena. And I had to make sure to cut away a little material where I'd forgotten there was a screw on the bottom of the robot that it would interfere with otherwise. I was hoping these titanium forks would be a big improvement over the nylon ones I'd been using before, which broke off so quickly in my other fights. But you'll just have to wait for the Norwalk February 6th fight recap video, which I hope to have ready in the next couple of weeks, to see how that worked out. That just about covers everything. I know a lot of my audience to this channel is relatively new. If that's you, welcome! From now on, while I still plan to create some very technical guides and tutorials, I also want these videos to be approachable to even casual BattleBots fans who are interested in robot combat in all of its forms. I don't want everyone watching this to need an engineering degree to know what's going on. Let me know in the comments if this video is easy to follow and understand, or what I could improve upon in that regard moving forward. And again, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you want to see the upcoming event recap video, or any more videos like this later on. This time around at Norwalk, Division was not alone. I brought along Draconid, and yes, at long last, Mini Mulcher will also make an appearance in the arena. Thanks for watching!